Hosanna. Sir. Sure. 
Do you feel the darkness tremble when all the saints join in one song? And all the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness. And here we see that God, you're moving. A time of jubilee is coming. And young and old will turn to Jesus. Fling wide you heavenly gates. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. Open up the doors and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing. Songs that bring Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Praise God. Let's continue to worship. <clears throat>
lifted high in our world. Be lifted high in our love. Be lifted high in my life. Be lifted high in our world. Be lifted high in our love. Be lifted. Thank you, Father. In the midst of so many wants these days, <laughs> the government wants compliance, <laughs> the Pharisees want recognition, but the people wanted a king like Jesus. Well, Lord, if this day has taught me anything, it's to look for you better than we did then. And I ask, what do you want? You wanted a, a people that were pure and holy. You didn't want just a king, but a lamb. Not just a nation, but children. And not just slaves, but friends. <laughs> and not even friends, you wanted a bride. <coughs> so not by might and not by power, but by your spirit. We say we're ready. We're ready for what you want, and we, we look for that above all else. So we just declare, worthy is your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. We're going to do the morning offering at this time. We have offering bowls both in the front and the back. You can drop it off at your convenience. Uh, <coughs> just a couple things, just adding to what we do in giving, you know, we want to acknowledge, you know, Sandy Takaezu for our beautiful Easter ladies and getting ready for our you know, Easter celebration. And we just thank you for that. You know, we thank you for everyone that you know that signed up to uh, bring uh, floral uh, decoration in the front here. Today we have uh, uh, the honor of uh, Lil, uh, Linda and Ainsley. Uh, well, being a uh, 
with uh, today's decoration, so it's beautiful. And we acknowledge that it's their 52nd anniversary. I think it's still awesome. Mm. Congratulations, Linda and Aisley. <clears throat> you know, we are a giving church, and I think the Lord has spoken to each one of you as far as being faithful in this area. And, you know, we are blessed here at Kappa Missionary Church because of your, your obedience in tithing <coughs> and offering that we are able to not only support the ministries in the church, but we are able to share our fine, what you give to other ministries here on the island and around the world. So we are thankful and we just ask you to, be, to continue with that uh, obedience of being able to bring your offerings to the church that we may be able to share it with others. Let us pray for this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your, for what you have put in our hearts, Lord. We are so blessed that we are able to share what you put in, what we have given, Lord, be able to share it with the people around the world, not only here in the church, but everyone, Lord. And Lord, we just continue to be obedient to what you have taught us, Lord. Be faithful stewards of our finances. And you said you will bless us abundantly, and you have, Lord. You have shown yourself as an awesome God. And we just give thanks for everyone for this morning's tithes and offerings. And we give praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
You know, I was thinking about what uh, Gene said last week. As he gets older, he finds it difficult to do more than one thing at a time. And I was telling my boys, I said, I'm to the point now where walking and talking at the same time is multitasking. So I'm going to stand really still up here today. <laughs> I woke up about 3.30 this morning with this message rolling through my head and didn't go back to sleep. So by the time I got up, I was ready for a nap. Uh, away we go. Uh, let me open with a prayer and then we'll start. Father God, again, we just ask, send your Holy Spirit here. Let your Spirit dwell amongst us. Send us peace and guidance. And just be with everyone in this building. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now, today is Palm Sunday, which is the start of Passion Week. And all of this is recorded in the Gospels, so I'm going to kind of go on a little sidetrack here first. Any of you ever notice if you're watching a show on TV and they're going to talk about the Bible, that they usually wind up trying to discredit it? It's, I don't know why. They just do. And I saw a show a few months ago, and they were talking about the unreliability of the Gospels because they were so different from one another. Well, they, they completely or intentionally ignore all of, the, all of the sameness of the Gospels. They all record Jesus' birth, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his ministry, his eventual crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and he's essential. They all agree on this. But they look at things from a different point of view. You've got to remember that Matthew and, Matthew, Mark, Matthew and John were eyewitnesses to his life. Uh, Mark and Luke got their information from other sources, other eyewitnesses, and they were writing to different demographics. They were writing to Jews, they were writing to Gentiles. The Gospels were going to, going to go out. But they did all agree. And if you read all four Gospels, you put them together, you get a good, good idea of, what, of what's actually happening. And I want to give you, I'm going to give you an example. I hope I can make this clearer. Let's say that uh, a husband and wife are walking down Rice Street, and as they get to, uh, just as they get to Bank of Hawaii, a woman comes running out the door as fast as she can, and as she's heading towards the street, a car pulls up, she jumps in, the car speeds off. Right behind her is an employee of the bank yelling, we've been robbed, we've been robbed, call the police. So a KPD shows up, some officers go inside to get statements, officers outside say, anybody see what happened? Husband, wife, yep, we saw it. Okay. So you start with the husband. What, tell me what you saw. Yeah. This car pulled up, this holy woman come running out, jump in the car, drove away. Oh, well, yeah, what'd she look like? Oh, average woman, you know. Brown hair, that was it. Really? Okay, that's the best you can do. All right. What about the car? He goes, oh, he says, that was a 2010 Murano. He said it was burnt orange in color. And he says, uh, the left front fender had yellow paint scraped on it like he'd hit a pole going through McDonald's drive through and, uh, and the left rear tire was a donut. It was a spare tire. <laughs> oh, okay. Did you happen to get the license number? Well, I got the first three. I got the, got the, uh, the letters. KFC, just like Kentucky Fried Chicken. KFC. So now he's got a pretty good description of the car. You go to the wife and say, well, what did you see? She goes, well, this woman ran out. She jumped into this orangey-looking car and it drove off. Okay, did you happen to get a look at her? Well, a little bit. Well, what she looked like? Well, she was about my height. How tall are you? I'm about 5'4". She was kind of thin, but not as thin as me. Okay, do you happen to know, did you notice anything about her? He goes, well, yeah, her hair was not brown. It was auburn, and she had bangs with blonde highlights in it. Her hair was straight, and it was shoulder length, and she had a pink butterfly beret in her hair. Oh, okay, what else? Well, she had a little gold necklace, and it had a little, a little red pendant on it. Okay. Uh, how was she dressed? Well, she had on a, had on a light gray sweater and three-quarter length sleeve, and it was tight at the waist, and I think she bought it at Macy's. Okay. 
Well, anything else? Yeah, she had on a, she had on a light, pl underneath it, she had on this light pink blouse with the, the big wide collar, and there was four pink buttons in the front, okay? Anything else? Well, yeah, she had on, uh, she had on uh, uh, pink pedal pushers, okay? Uh, you notice anything else about her? Well, yeah, she had on a, a pink glitter fingernail and toenail polish. Okay, well, how did you know she had on the, the toenail polish? Well, she was wearing this light gray uh, open-toed sandals with little gold buckles that matched the necklace and the bracelet. Did I mention she was wearing a bracelet, too, to match the necklace? Okay, that's a pretty good description. Anything else? Well, yeah, I didn't want to say anything, but... She was just wearing this hideous green mask that did not match her ensemble at all. Okay, so now they got a pretty good description of her. So you take his description, her description, the, the, the statements from the people inside, you put it together, you got a pretty good idea of what happened and who did it. But you have two people standing side by side, witnessing the very same event unfold before them, and yet they're looking at it through a different prism, their own point of view. So you take, like I said, you take all these, you put them together, you got a good idea. It's the same thing with the Gospels. Read all the Gospels, put them together, you got a good idea of what happened. They do not disagree with one another. Okay. I'll get started now. Uh, let's back up to Friday. I said, uh, Jesus arrived in Bethany on a Friday to spend time with uh, some friends. This was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This was the same Lazarus that uh, Jesus, uh, uh, Pastor Ed talked about a couple of weeks ago. So he spends, gets there Friday, spends Saturday the Sabbath with them, and then Sunday morning he and the disciples uh, head for, uh, well, I'm backing up here. Uh, he tells two of his disciples to go to Bethpage. You're going to find a colt. All of this is recorded in Zechariah 9, chapter 9. If you want to read it, you can. This is, this is foretold centuries before. So he gets his colt. He rides a colt into Jerusalem. And as he's entering, this is where Palm Sunday comes in. He said throngs of people were throwing their cloaks down and throwing down palm leaves and, and uh, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course, the Pharisees were there, and they were telling Jesus, rebuke these people. Don't let them call you a king. And Jesus said, if they don't, the rocks will cry out. Because all of this was foretold. This was going to happen. So the following day, he goes to the temple. And the first thing he does is he drives out all of the money changers. Now, remember, at the very beginning of his public ministry, this was the first thing he did. He went to the temple and drove out the money changers. Three years later, he's doing exactly the same thing. Right at the end of his ministry, now he's driving them out again. And then it records him, he said that he spoke daily in the temple. So you've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I probably part of Thursday, even though that was when they had the uh, Lord's Supper. So he taught in the temple and an interesting thing about uh, when, he, when he talked to people, you know, during his ministry, he never, never once condemned anybody except religious leaders, and he went after them constantly. You know, he called them broods of vipers, uh, whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones, uh, liars, hypocrites. He told the people while he was in the temple, this is just before his, or his arrest, of course, he said, if you do not have faith greater than these religious leaders, you have no chance of ever seeing the kingdom of God. And I don't think he made any friends amongst the religious leaders. <laughs> so that afternoon, <clears> he <throat> tells his disciples, or oh, who's it? Uh, Peter and John, he says, you're going to go into the city uh, to make preparation for the Passover. And he says, you, when you get in, you're going to see a man carrying a water pot. You follow him to his home. When you get there, you tell him that the master has need of a place for the Passover supper, and, and he'll show you where it's at. And it's, the, the, the room is there. And this is what the upper, when you hear the upper room, this is it. This is the place. Okay. So that evening, uh, Jesus institutes what we now call the Lord's Supper. We celebrated it last week. 
Now, Passover, uh, the, the, main, the main course in a Passover meal was lamb. If you go back to the time of Egypt when they spread the blood of the lamb over the doorposts, and that's how they celebrated Passover, with lamb as the main course of the meal. Well, at this meal, there was bread and there was wine. There was no cooked lamb because the lamb was there. He was the one instituting this, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he breaks bread, gives him the wine, and says that, you know, I'm going to be betrayed by evil men. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the disciples, you remember, <laughs> these are just men. They're just men. You know, if you go back to the first day, Sunday, when they're coming in, they're coming into uh, to, uh, Jerusalem and, and the thousands of people are throwing the palm leaves down. Can you just see the disciples walking along going, whoa, this is going to be a good week. Yeah, this is really going to be a good week. We got it made now. So he goes into the temple and, he, he, and he's teaching and he's, you know, they got throngs of people in the outer course, thousands of people coming to hear him. They're hanging on every word that he says and the disciples are going, yeah, yeah. It's time. He's going to take over now. <coughs> and even at this time, they, they still thought Jesus was going to take over. He was just simply going to, you know, by, by his own word. They'd, what do I want to say? By merely speaking it, he could, he could take control. And they were beginning to understand this. So they thought he was going to take over and become the king of Israel right then, run, run uh, the Roman army out of Israel. Uh, reason I say that is I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Now, he's, he said, here's the bread, here's the wine, and he's telling them everything that's going to happen. And he says, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Hey, I get to sit at his, no, you don't. I get to sit at his right hand. You can take two chairs down. I'm sitting at his right hand when this happens. You know, <laughs> they had no clue what was about to happen, even though Jesus had told them. This had never happened before. They, you know, if we put ourselves in their place, we, you got to understand, it's never happened. It's never happened. So they're, they're ready for him to take over, and they're going to sit at his right hand and left hand, and they're going to rule with the rod of iron, boy. Yeah. <laughs> so after the meal, they go to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus prays, and the disciples sleep. Okay. So he wakes him up and says, can't you even pray with me for a little while? Because he knows what's coming. It says, you know, that he was, by this time, he's praying great, great drop, like, as it was, great drops of blood. He knew what was coming for him. So about this time, here comes Judas with uh, the, uh, the religious leaders. It says they were the uh, chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders. These are the people that he was excoriating in the temple, and they wanted him dead so bad they couldn't see straight. They, they, were, they, had, a, they had an unbridled hatred for him, <laughs> like you cannot imagine. So it describes the various events that occurred there um, in the temple, I mean, in the, in the, uh, at the Mount of Olives, but they, they take him into custody and they take him to the home of the, uh, of the uh, high priest. Now, the disciples, like a covey of quail, they just, whoop, they're gone. They run. This isn't what, wait a minute, this isn't supposed to happen. So they run. Now, these men were so morally and so spiritually corrupt that they were incapable of seeing or hearing what he was saying. You go back to the garden. They show up there. They know who he is. They know they, they, he's been in the temple. They, they've been chasing him around for three years. They hate him. You know. So they go, you know, are you this Jesus? And he says, I am. And they're all knocked off their feet. Okay. And I think you can see these dudes in their big fancy robes getting, getting up and dusting themselves off. And, and then, the, then the disciples are going, shall we attack with swords? He says, no, you put him away, but one of them, probably Peter, I think it was, cuts off the ear of the, of the high priest's uh, servant. Now, this is where you tell them, don't quit your day job, because if the best you can do with a sword at three feet is to cut somebody's ear off, 
<laughs> don't do it. So Jesus picks up the ear, you know, puts it back on the guy's head. You know. And they're witnessing this as they've witnessed other thousands, uh, literally thousands of miracles, and yet they don't care. They don't care. See, to them, to these religious leaders, the temple was nothing more than a cash cow. And Jesus was standing between them and the money supply, and they were going to get rid of him at all costs. So they take him to the home of the high priest, and those that were guarding him, probably the captains of the temple guard, blindfold him and begin to beat him. Now remember, they've got several years of what do you want to call pent up rage <laughs> at, at Jesus they want to find it and this is it so they start beating him and they beat him and they beat him and they beat him and they didn't stop unmercifully so for the next <clears throat> 18 to 20 hours <coughs> no, pardon me while I'm standing here choking <coughs> Jesus is subjected to the most excruciating pain imaginable. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost beyond description, the, the pain that he went through. So he's beaten continually. He's dragged back and forth between uh, Herod and, uh, hold on here, Herod and Pilate, yeah. So eventually he winds up back in front of Pilate and he says, well, I'm gonna flog him and let him go. So oh, he's, he's been spit on, mocked, cursed, kicked, punched. The scriptures say that uh, he was without countenance. Now, without countenance means you're unrecognizable. If you had seen him at 2 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon and then seen him on a 30, 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, you would not have known it was the same man. So, Pilate says, well, I'm going to flog him and let him go. Now, flogging, unlike the stuff you see in the movies, you know, where it's some little, some little stick with three or four little leather straps on it and puts a welt on your back. No, no. These are Roman flogs. And they are leather straps about three feet long. I, I described this. In, am I on? Okay. I described this a few years ago, but... Uh, I think it bears repeating because we've got to remember what he went through. And in these straps are little bits of iron and bronze and maybe some broken bone tied into it. So that when it's laid across a man's back, it goes across the back and around the rib cage and embeds itself. And when he pulls it out, it rips out skin, flesh, muscle, tendons. Now the old, the old historians of the time report that Many of the men that uh, were flogged died of shock or blood loss even before they were done being flogged. They just, after a half a dozen or so, they were dead. They just went and they were gone. But Jesus withstood this flogging. Now, you've got to understand that by this time, his rib cage is exposed. His back is torn apart. His parts of his spinal cord are exposed. He's had his hair ripped out, his beard ripped. When you rip somebody's beard out, you don't pull the hair out. You pull the skin and the flesh. Everything is torn off. Probably every, his jawbone was probably exposed. Uh, he was covered in blood from the top of his head right down to the soles of his feet. Unrecognizable. And then when they were done doing this, they said, now you pick up that pole and you're going to drag it up to Golgotha. He had to take his own means of execution up the hill. So... It describes his trip up the hill, and I think it was Simon the Cyrene was forced to carry it along with him. But he get up there, and they put the tree on the ground, they throw him down on it, and they drive iron spikes into his hands and in his feet and stand him up into the hole. Not gently, just drop it in the hole. Now, unlike these little pictures you see, you know, here's Jesus, he's some little skinny dude nailed on a cross and he's got this towel wrapped around him and, a, and he's got a sad look on his face. Nothing's farther from the truth. He was a ripped, torn, shredded mass of flesh nailed on that cross. <clears throat> now we come to the words that were spoken by Jesus. 
while he was on the cross. Uh, the words were written by David some 14 generations earlier, about a thousand years earlier. And when they began to put the Psalms together in book form, uh, this Psalm became the 22nd Psalm. And it's the most quoted in the New Testament for obvious reasons. Now, I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, I don't know the backdrop for why David wrote this. We only, we know, I don't know what he was going through when he wrote it. Don't know where he was in his life, but we know that he wrote it because the Holy Spirit prompted him to write it. So, Christ began as some, again, the same thing the old historians say, that he didn't just recite some verses, he recited the, the entire psalm that was written by David. Now, the Gospels record seven specific verses that Jesus spoke from the cross. I just want to hit the first and the last, the first being, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some people will ask, well, why would God the Father forsake his own son? And because he had to. It was part of the plan. He's for the only... For, for a three, about a three-hour span there, the holy God could not look upon his son because his son had taken upon himself the sins of the world, the sins from the time of Adam and Eve until the time that Christ returns. All of the sins that have been committed and will be committed, he took upon himself. So the holy God can't look upon his son. Now, God the son is not God. He is holy man at this time. He is doing this as a man. So he cries out, why have you forsaken me? Now the last word spoken, it is finished, bring to a close about 2,000 years of prophecy concerning his coming, his birth, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. So this is all of the events that occurred. Well, the ascension occurred, what, 40 days later, I believe. But all of these events were prophesied for centuries. There's something else that uh, didn't have written here but occurred to me. After, after he was crucified, you know, it's kind of like a public hanging or something. Once you see it done, the crowd just leaves. They go away. So Jesus is left there and the only one is his mother, maybe Mary and Martha. They're there. And the religious leaders were there. And they continued to mock him. And they stayed. They were not going to hear about him dead. They were going to see him dead. And not until the Roman soldier ran a spear into his side and the blood ran out and the water ran out and they knew he was dead, then they left. But they stayed and watched to make sure he died. They hated him that much. Okay. Okay. Now David, the writer of this psalm, was no stranger to the feeling of being forsaken by God. During his nearly 15 years of running from, from Saul off and on, you know, Saul was, we would call him schizophrenic, but he was literally demon-possessed. You know, he'd say, come back, son, I love you, and then try to kill him. And this went on, you know, for 15 years, if you read about all of this. Oh, as an old king, it's going to happen to David again. David had a son named Absalom, and Absalom was his favorite son. Absalom was David's choice to succeed him as king, but he was not God's choice. And you can see by the actions of Absalom that uh, you, you can see why he was not God's choice. Over, over a period of time, Absalom had ingratiated himself to the people and finally had accumulated an army and he was ready to take control then. Not, he wasn't going to wait for his father to die. So he's got this army and he's marching on Jerusalem. And if you want, well, anyway, he's heading for Jerusalem. And word, of course, gets to David 
and says, and of course some of his advisors are saying, well, let's stand and fight. We'll kill this kid. He doesn't have the experience you do. Well, David didn't want to kill his son. He loved his son. So what does he do? He says, if I stay and fight, my son will die. The city of Jerusalem will be destroyed. So it would be better if I just leave. Let him have the city. So it says, David left. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapters 15 to 20 record all of this, this whole event. David, David flees. Uh, said he left barefoot, weeping, with his head covered. And his followers did the same. They just covered their heads and wept. Now, like I said, things went from bad to worse as David went along, or at least it looked like it. David's most trusted advisor, Ahithophel, Ahith if I pronounce it right, betrayed David. Now this was a man that was David's most trusted advisor. It says they went to the temple together. They prayed together. Yet he turned around and stabbed David in the back and went over to his son Absalom. So as they're fleeing the city, it records a series of events that went on and it reveals David's character in, in a lot of these things because Zadok the priest was going to go with David and he had the Ark of the Covenant with him and David said no, 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 you take this back to the temple, that's where it belongs, if God wants me to come back, I'll come back, but you don't, we don't take the, we're not taking this with us. So Zadok took it back. Then uh, it says that he was approached by a man named Ziba. Now, Ziba was the uh, servant of the son of Jonathan. And he was in charge of taking care of the property. Jonathan had a son that was lame in the feet. And this was his servant. And he came to, came to David and said, oh, uh, Jonathan's son, I forgot his name. Mephibosheth? Somebody tell me. Up. There you go. <laughs> said, oh, he's betrayed you. He turned. So David said, okay, you can have his property. Well, that turned out to be a lie, as I recall. Uh, so as David's fleeing, a man by the name of Shimei, Shimei, who hated David because he was a relative of Saul, came out and threw stones and heaped cursing upon David as he went past. And one of David's captains says, well, how about I go over here and take this guy's head off? And David said, no. He said, God sent him out here. God sent him out here to do this. So let it go. continues on. This is, this is sort of like, you know, uh, you've heard the saying, kick him while they're down. This is what was happening to David. A lot of guys were kicking him while he was down because they saw their chance to do whatever it was they could to, to David. You know, while he was like, sitting on the throne, they'd bow and smile and scrape and do all of that and say, yes, yes, yes. But when they thought they, they, thought they had him, they turned on him. So, <clears throat> Absalom enters Jerusalem and the throngs of people are shouting, you know, long live Absalom the king, you know. These are the same people that years earlier had cheered for David. Now they've turned on David and they're cheering for Absalom. Just as those who on Palm Sunday, many of those on Palm Sunday or five days later, screaming, crucify him, because he did not meet their expectations. Well, wait a minute. If you're not going to take control, get out of the way. We don't want you. You know, they were, they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. So in times of trouble, we're going to find out who our friends are. But rather than complain during this, as you read through the events, David didn't complain to God. He referred to God as his rock, his salvation, his fortress, his high tower. There's other, other ones, but I'll just stay with those. Now, like the disciples, we haven't got a clue what's going to go on this week. We don't know what's going to happen two hours from now, let alone two days from now. No. Statistically speaking, we're going to be here next Sunday. 
but we don't know that. We don't know what's going to happen to us during the week. Nobody does. So when we're betrayed by a loved one or a very trusted, close friend, our rock is there. And when we receive that midnight call that makes our heart melt like wax with grief, our fortress is there. And when the doctor looks you in the eye and says that one word that makes time stop and plans vanish, your salvation is there. Worship team, you want to come up? I'm going to add a little something here off the cuff. You know, we've sort of got an abbreviated worship team right now because Domi and Carol Ragsack aren't here. And they are visiting their firstborn grandchild, a boy. And if you know Domi and Carol, by the time they leave and come back here, that little boy is going to be thoroughly covered in the blood of the lamb. <laughs> so when dark days come, and they will come to us. They come to us all in one form or another. Just remember that Christ was forsaken by his Father when he took upon himself the sins of the world to save us. That he could in turn say to us, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Not for all eternity. Okay. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father God, thank you for being our God. A God who cares enough to send his son to save our souls. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Well, if that's it, that's it, Gene. <laughs> Gene, he likes to change the uh, schedule on us, so uh, we're not sure <laughs> what's going on sometimes. <laughs> I didn't change it. It's God. It's God. <laughs> God changed it. It's the spirit that changed. God. He changed does that a lot. Service, yeah, he does know. that a lot. But we, it's also when you obedient to the call. It, it's just, you know, whatever the Lord puts on your heart, this is the way we're going to go. We have an agenda, but God's agenda overrides us. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning's message. <coughs> right. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you went through. You thought about us as we, you walked that, that path to the cross, Lord. Even in your suffering, you thought about us, our sins, that you were willing to go to the cross to forgive us for our sins, to pay the full price of forgiveness. Well, what a blessing to be able to honor you this, during this time, Lord. You are amazing. I cannot even imagine what you went through on the cross. But you went there thinking about each one of us. And we give thanks that we are free today because of, what, because of your obedience to the Father. And Lord, as we go through the week, Lord, we just think about you, what you went through, what you did for us. Lord, we just give you all the praise and all the glory in everything that we do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, let's thank you, worship team. As you go, let's love God. Let's live aloha. 
and let your light shine. Amen. Amen. All right. Count everything as blessing, guys. Have a good day. Yeah. Does that make me?